time to do a big clean up around the house? We can help get rid of your unwanted items with a hard waste collection. You can book Norma to pick it up from your front yard, up to two times per financial year. To make a booking, call Norma on 8259-2100. The new My Playford mobile app is here. You can now stay up to date with the latest council news and info, set bin reminders, make online payments and send through your customer requests all in one place and at the touch of a button. Download the free My Playford app today for your iPhone or Android device. Want to know what's happening in the community? Subscribe to our fortnightly e-newsletter, Playford News at playford.sa.gov.au and you'll be on top of stories, news and what's happening in Playford. It's local news for local people. Good evening all and uh, welcome to this September meeting of the City of Playford Council Assessment Panel. I take this opportunity to welcome uh, members, staff and those who have joined us uh, in the gallery and online this evening. Uh, I'll start uh, by way of some introductions. The members of the uh, panel before you this evening, we have uh, to my left, uh, Mr. Aaron Curtis, uh, and to my right, Mr. Nathan Grantham. And uh, on the uh, table just down the front there, we have uh, Councillor Misty Norris uh, and Mr. Paul Micken. My name is Jeff Parsons and I'm the presiding member uh, and we are ably assisted by members of Council's administration who are with us this evening. We have uh, Adam, our assessment manager, uh, Connie and Miro, uh, our planning officers and Sky, who's assisting us with uh, governance and minutes this evening. So welcome to you all. Uh, members, the uh, agenda, uh, the first item is our attendance record. All members are present and accounted for. There are no apologies. The confirmation of the minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, the last meeting was held on the 15th of August 2022. All members have received uh, a copy of those minutes. Are there any questions in relation to the production of the minutes? No, in that case I'll ask for a mover that they be adopted, please. Uh, move Nathan, seconded Paul. All those in favour, please raise your hand. It's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, applications withdrawn tonight, I understand there are new. Uh, declarations of interest. Does any member have a declaration of interest they wish to declare? Nathan. Uh, thank you, presiding member. Um, I would like to declare an interest in item 6.1. Um, I note the application, um, sorry, the, there's a current application under assessment with the State Planning Commission. Um, with the commission being my, my nine to five job, um, yeah, I don't want to cause any conflicts with how I can deal with this application, but more so uh, to the point the application that's currently um, under assessment with the Commission, so I will excuse myself from that item. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any further declarations of interest, members? No. All right, that brings us to uh, our first item for consideration uh, this evening. And this is an application for a partial change in land use for accident towing service business. Uh, the applicant is Mr Justin Rocker. Uh, it's located at 29 Clark Road in Virginia in the Rural Living Zone. It was performance assessed and given public notification. Yeah, Adam, I um, understand you're um, filling in for the report author uh, this evening. So uh, is there anything you'd like to take us through as an introduction to the item, uh, please? 
Uh, thank you. Uh, no, look, there's nothing further to add from the report, but happy to take any questions from the panel, should they arise. Thank you. Uh, now, members, we did have uh, two representations that uh, indicated a desire to be heard. Uh, the first was uh, by Mr. Uh, Brett McBeath. Is Mr. McBeath with us this evening? Yes, excellent. So um, just before I ask you to come up uh, and, and give your representation, um, I'll just take uh, yourself and the rest of the gallery through some of the, some of the rules for, uh, for addressing the panel. So um, where we do hold a hearing of representations, this is really an opportunity for um, uh, any representor and the applicant to address the panel and to highlight any key points in their written representation uh, or response. Um, the panel, uh, all members have received a copy of all of the representations and the applicant's response so, uh, and they have all read and reviewed that so this is really an opportunity for you to highlight any uh, key points. Uh, any representative or applicant has five minutes within which to address the panel. I do normally just keep track just so we can provide procedural fairness to everyone. Um, if you just get close to that five minute mark, I'll just ask you to begin uh, summing up. Uh, the panel may have questions for you when you've finished your representation, so I'll ask you just to, to stay uh, at the podium here um, and I will ask the panel members for any questions. And the final point to make is that the panel's role tonight is not one of um, uh, mediation between the parties. Our role is to hear from representors and applicants, take into account all the information that's before us in the agenda uh, and that information that's provided by council staff and then make a balanced planning judgment on the proposal. So with all of that said, uh, Mr McBeath, um, there is an opportunity for you now to, uh, to address the panel. Would you like to come up to the podium here please? So this can be a little this can be a little daunting if you've never done it before, but there's no need for it to be. Uh, the panel's just interested to hear uh, what you have to say, so um, you can start when you're ready. Thank you. Thank you. Just a couple of quick ones. Um, it, if it is approved, it's setting a precedent for um, anybody else that wants to start a business. They just go ahead and build it and then put an application in later on because nothing's been approved there as yet. And, and then you're setting a precedent in that respect. Um, there's, there's all shift workers around where, around where the business is going, you know, the proposed business is going to be. And we're all shift workers and we went, we bought there for a reason, because it's quiet. You know, I start at three in the afternoon and finish at three in the morning and, and, and there's other truck drivers next door and a mechanic and everything, you know, and they do shift work. So, it's quiet and that's why we bought there. If we wanted to build, you know, live in an industrial area, we would have bought at Dry Creek and paid $200,000 less, you know? So, and, and, and there's gonna be, like, if it's approved, there's gonna be uh, trucks banging with chains on, on trays, on steel trays and, and high revving for tilting the trays and so forth, 24 hours a day, you know? People break down, they don't wait till nine o'clock to ring a tow truck. Yeah, you know, it's um, and there's been a, been other business there. I've been there 12 years now, and there was another business um, application there for for a packing shed, and it was knocked back, and uh, then it was reapplied as a smaller business, and it was knocked back then too. So, you know, a packing shed only works what eight, ten hours a day, and it's only packing fruit and vegetables, not very noisy. But that was disapproved too. So, if you're going to approve a 24-hour noisy business, well, it's become an industrial area then, hasn't? It? Yeah. That's about all I've got to say. Just to push on what what I wrote down. Yeah. No, thank you, Mr. Beth. I'll just ask you. Sorry, just before you step away, I'll just ask the panel if there's any questions um, they would like to ask you. Do you have any questions, panel members? Yes, Paul. Thank you. Um, have you, how um, I guess how, how often have you um, experienced um, movement, say after nine pm in the early hours of the morning? Have there, has there been much action in that period? Not in the last three weeks, but before that, yeah. 
pretty well, you, well, you could pretty well say every second day anyway, without too much problem. Every day is probably going to miss a few, but every second day, yeah. yeah. Any further questions, members? Uh, in that case, I just have one, I think, Mr McBeth, which is um, the principal impact, um, am I correct in assuming it's noise related from the gate and the truck? That's the primary um, concern that you have? Well, that right? there's that and uh, also then there'll be cars stored there with fire hazards, snakes, rats, thieves. You know, we already get people wandering around and not really sure who the business is because the house is on Clark Road but the business is on... on um, I forget what other road, Ramsey Road, and they're sort of knocking on neighbours' doors, you know, wanting to get in there or something, but they don't know where the owner of the business lives. So, you know, people are getting impacted like that. But yeah, just fire hazards, snakes, and God only knows what else. When, you know, you say yes to one thing, well then it's going to blow out to everything. Then that's, that's all. Thank you. I think... That's all our questions, so thank you. Welcome to um, stay in the gallery and uh, observe the debate and the decision uh, in respect to this matter. Um, now, members, there was also um, a further representation to be heard, um, which was, and I'm not sure, uh, I apologise if it's Mr or Mrs Sissis. Uh, Are they with us this evening? No? OK. There's no need to hear that representation. Uh, and I believe we do have the applicant with us this evening, uh, Mr Justin Rocker. Uh, you with us, Mr Rocker? Would you like to come forward and, and respond to the representations? Thank you for being here tonight. Apologies to waste your time and mine. Um, long story, but um, I'm tired of being harassed by City of Playford and their representatives. Um, I have had dealings where they've un acted unlawfully and harassed me and intimidated me for the past three years, and I'm just tired of it. Sorry, Mr. Rock, can I... Can I, I know, um, it's not sorry, not I'll just interrupt you. The panel's role tonight is one where we have to make a decision in respect of the development application that's before us. So um, any dealings that you might have had with the City of Playford that, that predate that or are uh, separate to that matter are not really something that we can take into account. So what, I'm, what I would like to hear from you tonight is um, just your views around uh, the concerns that have been raised by the representor um, and obviously um, your response to uh, any particular planning matters around your proposal. So if I could ask you to focus on that, that would be appreciated, I'll, please. I'll attempt to do so. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Um, basically, it's a rural living zone. It's not a residential zone. If I wanted a residential zone, I would have bought a 300 square metre block, not a 10,000 square metre block. Um, uh, where is it? The shed itself is actually in breach of the planning laws as it is built within 25 metres of a boundary. Something I brought to the attention of Andrew when he visited the site. Instead of arguing with him, I just rather pointed out that my house is also built within 10 metres of a road boundary. So I'm tired of paying for other people's mistakes to start with. Um, as, for the pro as for the proposed development at hand, the notion of the minor use change is disruptive or, or de detrimental to the area is amusing. Currently, the property, and my shed in particular, is under the direct flight path of the RAF base. The expressway is less than half a kilometre away, as is Mondello Farms. The property is situated between two market gardens at opposite ends of the road, where workers are constantly walking from one end of the street to the other. That's where I believe Brett thinks that my customers are walking around. It's actually not. It's the, it's the property owners. Also going on with Brett when he was saying the um, knocking on the door isn't actually possible because my whole business there is, it's a secondary yard. My primary yard is at the service station and customers only come to the secondary yard by appointment only 
because it's not listed on any of my official stuff for that reason. So there won't be any, you know, I don't want people rocking up at the door when no one's there. So it's only by appointment. So they literally ring me 10 minutes away. I send them the address and they're there. There is no door knocking because I am there when they get there. Uh, where was I? Um, to give you perspective of the rest of the disturbances on the street, um, let's see, so one property has a corner driveway, which is illegal on a blind corner. Another adjacent property has two truck and dogs parked there illegally on, the, on, on his site at all times. Another neighbour has his semi-trailer and truck parked on the road at all times. That same neighbour also has... Um, multiple car and truck wrecks on his property, which is a fire danger and a snake hazard danger. Um, another neighbour has multiple sheds, which none of them are legally compliant, because you can clearly see it from the satellite view. Um, another neighbour uses... Um, uh, another neighbour uses um, quad bikes and dirt bikes on a weekly basis, at least. Um, but the, but the main point, as Brett mentioned, is most of the pe a lot of people on the street are shift workers, but they don't work the same shifts. They all work separate shifts, coming and going at different times. They're actually disturbing each other when they leave. The uh, there are neighbours with loud and um, you know cannons and stuff on their on their on their cars that hoon down the street on a daily basis. I, whenever I'm at home and I want to have a rest day, I am woken up by all the neighbours driving past. The problem is, is all the neighbours are all noisy, but because my shed is the newest thing, everything's my fault. Like, they're all making noise on each other, but they just don't realise it. Um, I haven't lodged any complaints for regards to the noise because, well, I don't care. Well, I'm not going to bother bugging a neighbour when it doesn't benefit me. But if I have to lodge, if this um, application's failed because of the disturbance that I am alone causing, I'll have no choice but to lodge complaints for all the other neighbours. And I expect them to be harassed and intimidated to the level that I've received for the last three years. Just, sorry, Mr Rocket, to interrupt you, and I'll give you time while I'm speaking. But um, as I said before, the panel's role is one where we have to consider this proposal we can't consider what else might be happening in the locality. That's something that the council staff might address or might deal with at some future point. So, again, I would just ask if you can limit your comments to the proposal that's before us and anything you would like us to take into account in respect of your actual proposal itself rather than what might be occurring on neighbouring land, which will be um, potentially, if it's warranted, investigated by council staff separately. So. The, the, the point of the neighbouring land and their activities is relevant given that the neighbour's opposition to it is based on the disturbance. When, as I'm saying, is I'm not actually the one disturbing, they're disturbing each other. As, um, I'll, I'll get back to, I'll rebut Jack Brett's in a moment, I'll just go where I was lost at. Um, ironically is, um, should this application be refused, um, what else can I use the shed for, which is within the zoning? Um, one of those which would be agricultural, such as a packing shed, which is allowed in the zoning. Another use would be light industry. Alternatively, I could write a novel in the shed um, with heavy metal music playing for eight hours a day, if I wish to, as a residential property. All of those would be far more disruptive than the current use as it is. Speaking of which, the current use. Um, the current use, um, the proposed development is currently operating over capacity, as it was only meant to be a secondary depot. My primary depot, is currently unable to be used due to um, criminal negligence from Playford Council actions. Long story. But basically, is this is only supposed to be a secondary depot. The only reason it is as busy as it is now is because I can't use my other one, which I'm going to court with Council on Thursday. Again, not relevant, but it's backstory. Right. Um, uh, where was I? Um, yeah. I'd also like to point out, I take pride in the appearance and the upkeep of my, of my uh, house. My property and the house and the shed is actually the most maintained on the entire street. My, my um, grass is, ma is maintained to a proper level. You know, I keep the weeds down, all nice new fencing. Anything unsightly from the business is kept behind a two metre high colour bond fence, if it is unsightly anyway. And then inside the yard itself is again maintained. I've already, I am, 
I am petrified of fire, to say the least. So even though my original application doesn't require it, I have multiple fire extinguishers, multiple fire hose reels already on site, regardless of not having to need it at present. So the fire issue is there, there is no issue with fire. Um, uh, yeah. So then just going on to rebut basically everything that Brett said. Well, yeah, not rebut, just to clarify. Because, sorry, Mr Rocker, you're at five and a half minutes, so I'm happy to give you just, just a couple just, of just minutes. Just a quick just couple just to, notes. Yeah, thank you. Tom. So um, he said about it setting a precedent that, you know, a business can come in and, act and get approval after the fact. That's not actually true. The shed and compound were built legally <laughs> and to code as they were. After the shed was built, um, there has been back and forth when it was cancelled whether or not the approval was relevant. Still arguing through the court, and that's yet to be determined. So the point is, it, it, the operation didn't come out of nowhere. The shed wasn't built non-compliantly. It's just it was always there. Um, as for the shift workers, as I pointed out, it's they are literally working. They are waking up each other, and regardless, any other um, area, it doesn't affect. It's not your fault that your neighbour is a shift worker. It's to say that I can't make noise on my property during the day because the neighbours might wake up because they're shift workers. Like, it's, it's absurd. It's like, I'm not saying I'm going to be a, 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 you know, a pain about it and make noise or more. If I'm making too much noise because you want to sleep until 10am, just say, hey, can you, like, make some less noise? I'm like, OK, fine, I'll, I'll do something else that's not so noisy if you want to sleep in for a couple hours. Just come and talk to me. Don't just lodge a complaint with a cancel. It's bonkers. Um, also, as, as I said, the actual site is operating above capacity as it is now. So, despite Brett's concerns, it will not get busier because it's above capacity as it is. If anything, it will get less busy when my primary depot is rectified with my fight with the other fight. That's a different issue. So, that's the other thing. Um, also, as for the... You asked earlier about the uh, after-hours movements on the site. Um, despite what... Brett believes uh, I have um, SAPOL records because I'm a SAPOL contractor to show otherwise. Most of the call outs are in normal hours, and the after hours call outs, I make it a point to be as quiet as possible. Because let's just assume no one cares about their neighbours. If I wake up my wife and kids, I'm a dead man. So I am as quiet as possible. I do not rev the engines. I literally, if I have to unload a car, I leave it until the next morning. Or I, you know, it's as quiet as possible. I've never woken up my wife and my kids. And I'm the closest house, so how can anyone else be affected by it? But they think it's me driving with the truck when it's the other neighbour leaving with his truck in the morning. See, do you see the, you know, the issue? It's the disturbance is not me, but they just all assume it's me because it's a newer shed. Um... Probably, I probably need to stop you there, Mr. Rocker, just because yeah, I've given you much um, it, eight minutes. But the panel might have questions for you, for which you might want to expand on. Uh, panel members, do you have any questions you would like to address to Mr. Rocker? Uh, Aaron. Yeah, thank you, through the chair. Um, so the application, as it's been submitted, states in respect to operating hours between 9am to 5pm Monday to Friday with call out hours occurring between hours of 7am and 9pm. The information in the report suggesting that your business um, refers to accident towing 24 hours, seven days a week. Are you able to explain that to us, um, how you propose to make the well, how you propose to deal with the hours of operation that you put forward in the application? Because it um, also, I guess, would like you to address the matter that the representor uh, raised in relation to vehicles being towed, um, stated to be, you know, early, early hours in, in the morning and having a detrimental impact on neighbours. Well, well, as I said, it's, it's a secondary depot. It's the, basically it's the mm -hmm. overflow yard for when the other one's full. So all the after hours work would ideally be at the primary depot, which, again, another problem, can't use it at the moment, but that's, that will be rectified before long. Um, and uh, so, where have I got lost? So what was the question again? Just, just, just so, so just wanting you to confirm, I guess, how you um, intending to operate within the hours you've put forward. Ah, I yeah. think you, what yeah. you've so, said is... So, basic, so basically is the most noise that there would be 
is if it's after hours, is literally hopping in the truck and leaving, which is the quietest vehicle on the street. And that is it. There's no additional noise because when it comes back, it will either be left on the truck or it will be unloaded at the primary depot. Like, if I need to to get it approved, I'll happily base the trucks at the primary depot, um, which I can do, in which case there is no leaving after hours. And then in which case the cars would be unloaded the following morning at the yard. So the, I said, I'm not... If there has to be conditions, there are conditions. It's, you know, I, I will abide by the conditions if they're reasonable. I was to say, like, I just can't do it, use my shed at all after I've built it is painful. Um, oh, and I'd just, just like to add the part about the door knocking, he said, with the neighbours going on a thing. That, that issue is resolved with a, a sign on the fence, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, no one's going to get confused if there's a sign there, so... No, thanks, Mr. Uh, Paul. Uh, thank you. Um, through the Chair, the um, application show, or the plan show four tow trucks. Does that imply that there's... All four could leave at, at the same time and return at varying, hour, at varying times? Um, as, as I tried to explain to many people, it's... There are four trucks presently um, and they're all for different tasks. Like the big truck is for a caravan, for example. You know, the smaller trucks are for recoveries, but you're not going to do them all at the same time. It's, I've only got one driver and me. So there's only two of us. So you can't have more than two trucks leave at any given time because they're specialised for their own fields. Um, next question. The, um, your planning consultant in his report mentions a few times that Movement, movements will be limited to three, three per day. How, how do you uh, propose to limit them? I did say that to him. I said, it's, he, he used the word limited, I said, on average, two to three times a day. Like, inevitably, there will be the busy days where you have five or six or, you know, some movements. And then, like, if you look, I've, I look at all my records, my truck barely moved for the month of August because it's just the name, it's on average it would be two or three times a day. And again, once my primary yard is operational again, then it becomes a secondary yard, so those movements are limited again. Thank you. Um, another question. The, um, again, the consultant's report um, talks about, or makes reference to vehicles that are awaiting um, assessment, insurance assessment, mm -hmm. prior to collection. What happens in the event that a vehicle is written off? How long would it, what would happen to it then? Would it stay on site for an indeterminate time? Um, well, it's not indeterminate time because, you know, like Workers' Lean Act and all that stuff. But the general rule of thumb is you have a car accident, what do you do? No one knows. So the general rule of thumb is you bring it back to our depot, you bring your insurance company, and they deal with it in the morning. Some insurers take it straight to a crash repairer the next day. Others get it assessed in my yard. Um, and then it, after it's written off, it goes to the auctions within a week or two, at the most. You get the occasional car that might sit there for a month while someone's arguing, but that's rare. And same sort of thing with, um, with uninsured vehicles. Um, the same sort of thing happens. Like after a few weeks, they just sort out the car and it goes for scrap. They're not, no cars are dismantled or wrecked or repaired on site. It is simply a midway place between locations. Any further questions, members? No? In that case, uh, thank you, Mr. Rocker. You're welcome to uh, return to the gallery and uh, observe the rest of the proceedings. Um, Sorry. You, how long does this normally last? I've just got the kids to deal with, that's all. Uh, um, well, we'll ask the panel members to debate and come to a decision now, so possibly 10 minutes. Of course. Mm. Thanks. Thanks. Now, members, um, there is an opportunity for you to ask any questions of the staff at this point if you would like to. Mm. Are there any questions you would like to raise? No? Oh, Paul. Uh, through the chair. Um, I understand enforcement proceedings have been going on for, what, some 12, 18 months, um, whatever the period is. What, how has the business changed in, since, it, since proceedings first started? The um, applicant has mentioned that it's currently um, at its peak, but um, how, how has it changed, and has it changed over the time? 
thank you. Through the chair, um, yeah, I, I think those comments relate to a secondary site, which is um, which is going through a process with council at the moment. So I, I, I'm not best placed to elaborate on on that side of things in terms of the enforcement proceedings for this site. I suppose that's what's led to the current application that's before the panel today. Um, so yeah, that's that's where it's at. All right. If there are no further questions for the administration, we can always come back if we uh, need to during our debate. Um, I'm seeking your views on this, members. You do. Uh, you've obviously heard from uh, a representative and the applicant. Uh, you have a detailed report before you, which recommends refusal of the application. How would you like to proceed? What are your views on this matter? Aaron. Yeah, I guess just before going into more detailed discussion, I'm um, interested to note that the report um, resolves that the proposal is seriously at variance with the planning design code. And I guess that's important in that if, if we are to agree with that recommendation, then, then we must refuse it as per the, um, the PDI Act. So I think it's just something that we might want to turn our minds to. Um, appreciate that's tied up in the same consideration of, of the full um, you know, merits of the proposal, but um, I'm just mindful as well that if we do um, reach that conclusion, then we must refuse the application. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a very valid observation, and uh, after our debate, we will need to give some thought to, uh, to that wording uh, in the recommendation, potentially. So, members, who would like to start? What, uh, how are you feeling about this proposal? Nathan. Thank you. Through the chair. Um, look, I have to say I'm in, in agreement with the um, planning officer's report. Um, I believe a use such as this, at this size and scale, is, is not anticipated in a rural living zone. Um, anticipated or expected, um, nor should um, people living in that zone um, expect to expect to manage their lives with um, with the use such as this in place. Um, I note that portions and parts of rural living zones around the state have become some somewhat conflicted with land uses, but um, the locality in place here is is exactly what a rural living zone is. Um, it's it's a residential lifestyle. It does obviously accommodate and um, some non-residential uses, but nothing of the size and scale of, of what we've um, what we've got before us. So, um, and obviously hearing from a representative and reading the other representations, there's obviously causing some conflicts with the with the residents. Um, and I haven't probably heard too much tonight that would um, convince me otherwise that that's, that's not the case. So um, in light of that, I'm, I'm happy with the, uh, with the recommendation, albeit maybe some changes of words. So thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, thanks through the um, chair. Yeah, I also agree with the um, the report, the recommendation. Um, I guess I'll come back to the um, desired outcome for this zone, spacious and secluded residential lifestyle within semi-rural, semi-natural environments, providing opportunities for a range of low intensity rural activities and uh, home-based business activities that complement that lifestyle choice. So when I, I just go back and read that um, and I look at the nature of this activity and what's occurring, I, I see that there is a fundamental conflict, um, both in, type, in terms of the, the land use itself being an activity you would expect in a strategic employment zone, and also the scale of it, that there's a substantial number of vehicles within you know, quite a large enclosed yard. The yard itself is incongruent with the with the locality, which tends to be open-sided style fencing, um, you know, semi-rural um, locality. So um, I guess there that's fundamental to me. The um, I also have concerns just about the you know, the proposed arrangements that have been put forward with operating hours, and um, as mentioned about the number of. Um, Toes likely to occur to the site. I think it's quite unclear, and I think the um, I have concern that what's actually been put forward in in terms of the operating hours is, is actually not what's occurring. I think the um, 
indications from the representors is that the activity is more expansive in terms of operating hours. So I, I do reach the conclusion with this proposal that it is seriously a variance with the planning design code and um, I, I can't see any way of um, supporting it. Thank you. Uh, Paul. Thank you. I'll keep it brief. Um, the applicant has um, made reference to a number of other activities that have taken place in the in the area, of, for example, packing and so on. But um, I think the, there are certainly a variety of land, land uses in the area, but they're all uses that one would normally anticipate to locate in a rural type area. And they're all, I think, majority are connected to primary production in one way or, or another, whereas the um, proposed development is um, certainly not linked to um, primary production. So uh, I think in that context, it's um, it's not well placed. It would be more appropriate in a, a zone, such as in commercial or industrial, presumably similar zoning to where the primary applicant's primary business is located. Thank you, Misty. Do you care to comment? Um, look, I think most things have been said. Um, I do agree with the recommendation. Um, I think, again, you guys have mentioned it before, we don't have full, full clarity around sort of the business hours operation, uh, you know, the disturbance, the number of toes, etc. You know, we've been given a figure, we've been given hours of operation, but I don't necessarily know that that's going to occur. Um, I do note that obviously with the fences, etc., that things are sort of visually hidden, so, you know, I can respect that, um, but I still think there's concern for obviously noise levels um, again I've even noticed perhaps like the wildlife nesting etc if the vehicles are there longer than than anticipated um, I think sorry I did have something else uh, resident service noise visual actually no sorry that was that question was already answered in terms of how long the cars may be present and again you know, it might only be an occasional concern, but it's still one that, that obviously I have concerns with. Um, pests that may occur around the residential property and obviously affect the neighbouring properties as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I have similar views to you all members. Uh, I don't believe the proposal is small scale. Um, uh, I think we clearly have an understanding that, that there can be call outs you know, after the hours that have been anticipated. I don't think the use is ancillary to the residential use of the land. I think it's a standalone use in its own right. Um, I think Aaron quoted the, the desired outcome uh, that was sought here, and I agree that um, this proposal doesn't fit with that. Uh, pardon me. I think um, another issue that we haven't touched on but I think was raised was that of, of floodlights in the facility in, in what is essentially a fairly low light environment. Um, and, and the potential that has to cause impact. Um, and uh, I, I think the, the potential impacts from, from noise in particular um, have the potential to cause disturbance to the locality. So uh, I agree with the views you have expressed and it sounds like we are all uh, in agreement on this matter. Perhaps the one element we may not be in agreement with is whether or not the proposal is seriously at variance or whether it is just at variance. Um, there's you know, some case law around this and I probably won't do it justice if I try to summarise it, but um, Essentially, as I understand it, uh, if we believe a proposal is seriously at variance, um, it is fundamentally at odds with the policy um, in the planning and design code, so much so that um, it could not reasonably be contemplated. Um, alternatively, we might just believe that the proposal is at variance rather than seriously, where, whereby we may feel that um, fundamentally the use uh, potentially may be appropriate but there isn't um, enough uh, conformity with the provisions of the code to warrant uh, a more favourable decision so um, that's my interpretation. Um, I think um, we have a, a decision to make as to what our view is. I think Aaron's put a view that um, he believes it's seriously at variance um, and I'm not sure if you're prepared to to move that way or, or if other panel members have a similar or, or different view. I'm happy to hear from you on how you may wish to proceed. 
Aaron. Yeah, I'll, I'll recommend it. Yep. Oh. So Aaron's moving the recommendation that the proposal is seriously at variance. Is there a seconder uh, to that? Seconded poll. That becomes the motion. All those in favour, please raise your hand. And that's carried unanimously. So for the benefit of those who have joined us, the application has been refused uh, consent. Now, um, there uh, will be a right of appeal that's available to uh, Mr Rocker. Uh, the parties will be advised of the decision in writing in due course by the council, and that will contain some information around that. Uh, and if you would like to discuss the various uh, options or the various pathways that are available, what happens from here, uh, the staff will be happy to assist you uh, during the next business day. We uh, do need to move to another item on our agenda, so you're welcome to stay and observe the rest of the meeting or you're welcome to leave us now as well. So thank you for your attendance. Um, and members, we must now move to item 6.1 on our agenda. Now this is the item for which Nathan has a conflict. So Nathan, if you'll kindly remove yourself from the room and we will grab you when we have finished this item. Now, members, um, this application, just bear with me. Sorry, members, that will teach me for not having my pages bookmarked. Uh, so, this application is for heavy vehicle uh, and equipment depot office and two shipping containers. Uh, the applicant is Mr Jamie Ross and is located at Lot 8 Karkloo Road in Parafield Gardens. He's in the Rural Horticulture Zone Performance Assessed uh, given public notification and we did receive two representations. Uh, now, Adam, I understand you're also filling in for the report author tonight for uh, this item. Is there anything you'd care to take us through as an introduction to the item, please? Um, yeah, thank you. Apologies, the assessing officer was unable to make it due to the change in the meeting date. Um, so those apologies are passed on to the panel. Um, look, nothing further to add to the report. Um, there has been a request come in today from both the applicant and one of the representatives to address the panel. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll leave that to the discretion of the panel. Thank you. So. Um Yes, members, as you've heard, um, there were two representations. Uh, both did not indicate a desire to be heard, but uh, Ms Janet Edwards has subsequently indicated that uh, she would like to be heard by the panel. The applicant, uh, who is represented uh, by planning consultant uh, tonight, has also asked to address the panel. Uh, I believe that decision is uh, at my uh, and the panel's discretion. Um, I am happy uh, to hear from both the representor uh, and the applicant. I think that will aid in our decision making. Uh, I would uh, presume that the panel have no objection to that. Uh, so that being the case, uh, there will be an opportunity for Ms Jada Edwards and uh, Mr Adam Williams to address us. Um, Ms Edwards, would you like to come forward please? You saw the way it operated previously, Miss Edwards. So um, you saw the way it operated previously. Yeah. So uh, happy for you to commence when you're ready. Thank um, you. Okay. I apologise for, for this you know, late night. I didn't realise that there was a new submission that I could look at that had a different um, sound here. Uh, yeah, yeah just that. can you just press nice. the button, Adam? The button, I think oh, it might be off. Yeah. I have another voice. There you go. Yeah, I'm sorry that I at such late notice, but I didn't realise that there was another application that had been amended and I had replied to the first one. Um, and then I, I had a look at it quickly today and then felt quite um, worried again that some of the things that have been said may 
that have been adjusted uh, are not allaying any of our concerns. And I still don't believe that. I'm, I'm really nervous here. I'm sorry. Um, That's fine. You can, you can take your time. As I said before, the panel's yeah. just interested to hear what you have to say. The, so. the main thing that just struck straight out at me that it was a quote in there that's saying that we're actually not against the development. Um, we're just, we were just against the um, intrusive activities that were happening on the corner. Well, that's not true. We are totally against it, the development. It's flawed in that, that that's what we think. We, we note that the new application has two or well, three sort of areas, just quickly looking at it this afternoon, that, that one, that, it's, that the, uh, the new application is just, the, uh, the block is just seamlessly fitting in with the area, that there's a change in times of work, that there's less people going to be involved, and there, that's just, and that I just don't believe that. Firstly, there's a thing that says it's a one-man show or something like that to that effect. Well, there's huge trucks there, huge amount of machine, sometimes four big ones. I, I don't know trucks, so just large trucks. You've seen photos of them. How can it be a one-man show? They talk about seasonal workers all of a sudden today. There's no working, there's no farming going on there. So I don't know why you would have seasonal workers. There are actually four people working there. I did have a member of twice i've had somebody from the family visit me verbally speak to me about things not not kindly and the last one told me that they had just employed a new guy because their business had it, had him got bigger because they realized that they weren't going to make any money off of as a, um, a horticultural business it's only 4.2 hectares it's now been down to 2.5 hectares and even if somebody farm that 2.5 hectares constantly, you know, to make a, a viable proposition. It wouldn't even get within 5% of the noise that is currently generated out of that property with comings and goings. And I think because it's such an amphitheatre type environment where we live, we can hear everything. They talk about the trucks and that they're going to turn the trucks down. That's, that's, that's humiliating to us to say that. That's why we're unhappy about it. The trucks and the exhaust and the, and the noise associated with it, we can still hear the trucks. The trucks still go there occasionally. It's obviously they've left because they had to leave the area or whatever, they've relocated. But even when they go there now, we still hear them. It's not like we can't hear them. We can hear, I can hear trailers getting changed, constant vehicles getting changed. Um, what do you call it? Um, bulldozers going on and off, then there's trench diggers, and there's all sorts of things. It happens all the time. There's that many different trailers there. I, d I have no idea if the items that they've listed are accurate. wouldn't have a clue. Um, another thing they talk about is it's been typical in the area. It is not seamlessly typical in the area. No block that size or any of the small holdings nearby, none of them have giant sheds and all that sort of stuff. The two big producers in the area, yes, they do have big sheds, but they have 100 acres, they have many, many staff, and they have a compound where all their stuff is kept. And they don't make noise at night. They do not stay there till 10 o'clock at night. The new, the new times that I noticed today said that they would be going from, I think, whatever it was, it was before it was from five to 10, because that was accurate. They would leave at five in the morning and they could get home at 10. In between could be comings and goings with another trucks, smaller trucks, not just the bigger ones. So now, what's going to happen when they get a call out to go somewhere in South Australia where they need to be there at six or seven in the morning? What, well, they're not going to go? Who's going, who's, who's going to monitor there the times where they, where they come and go? They sometimes, uh, now I realise why they've been there at five o'clock in the morning and they take off because they get to stay there and I didn't realise that there was a rather large house inside there where people get to stay or well, that's so when they get to stay there because maybe they have to go early in the morning that's when the night works there they'll stay out there to midnight some nights just working just changing things i think it's because they keep i don't know and they often have big lighting which is i've highlighted um i just, it just the new application just does not allay our fears i honestly felt the first application must have mentioned the word farm a hundred times in it, or between the two applications, because there is another one. 
there is no farm. There isn't a typical area. Normal farms don't look like that around there. I've really enjoyed meeting all the people that are surround us. Everyone in there, we get given vegetables from everyone. All we get from there is noise and people, and, and, the, and another thing which was quite sad to hear it was the last visit from the father-in-law who told me that, yes, they deliberately could drive past our place to make it noisier. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. He also told me that we had dug a hole, that we, we would be very sorry that we had made this complaint. And I tried to say that, well, initially, yes, we did make the complaint, but we haven't been the one to continue on with, with giving them the restrictions which we believe that they needed anyway. And so we just, then when I saw the application with some of the things, it's just, it's just not true. We hear everything. I can hear voices there. And I think it is because we've got the Gawler River, we've got the Mount Lofty Ranges and the Plains, and you can hear everything. So to say that they're so far away and they're not impeding us is just, it's just ridiculous. Sorry, Miss Edwards, I've, I've given you six Five, minutes. Okay, Could I just ask you to sum up, if that's... Well, I just, we just don't believe that the, the, the revised application is going to sort out this issue. How do, you, how do we even delve with... I mean, they do... Oh, look, the last one, I'm sorry I've forgotten, is they do Sundays. I've sent photos of, of them on Sundays. They do do public holidays. The trucks are... They're, it's almost indiscriminate, and I, I don't believe that we've been considered as a neighbour at all. And we don't have to be friends, but we certainly should. We should be able to live without having to constantly wonder what's going on across the road. Or we don't even have to wonder; we just know what's going on across the road. And we are only metres away. They keep talking about all these other dimensions, but we've, I'm from here to the wall, our corner of our. Show. Our away. No, thank you, Ms. Edwards. You made your points well. Uh, members, are there any questions that you would like to ask, Ms. Edwards? No. In that case, uh, thank you, oh, Aaron. Yeah. Um, in, I believe, your representation, there is some photos to uh, this one image with lighting. Uh -huh. uh, large lights. Is that uh, those lights on all the time, or only sometimes? Well, not in the day. Yeah, obviously <laughs> I'm referring to night time. Yeah, they're often. Well, they also have lights that sort of light up their driveway when they come in, and then those lights go on. <clears throat> when we first, but and I must say that things have changed because they've moved out. But it could be that those lights are on, and then the bulldozer or the whatever the trend, the the front end loader, would then go onto that block and just work there till 10 to 10.30 at night. The lights are on there so it can facilitate their night works, which is servicing vehicles, washing them. Um, there's, they, what else do they do? They, they change over the trailers, reversing back and forth, changing things. It can go on and on. It can stay, they can stay on there till midnight. I, I don't time them, I mean, it sounds like with some of the photos that we sent that we were obtrusive, but they were just getting that from our cameras, like. But they light up the front of our house. They light up down the street. And yes, they can be on, but as I said, not recently because they've left. But previously, there was no, no rhyme or reason. Of course, daylight saving, they would come on even earlier if it wasn't daylight saving. Come on at six o'clock. Thank you. Any further questions? And I stand by everything that we've written. If we have done, if I have written something that they believe is incorrect, I apologise. But no, I, I believe, and for, we are. <clears throat> no, that's fine. Thank you, Miss Edwards. Well, you're um, you're welcome to uh, retire to your seat and uh, observe the rest of the meeting and the decision. Thank you very much. Uh, there is an opportunity uh, now for us to hear from the applicant, who I believe is represented by Mr. Adam Williams. Um, Mr. Williams, would you like to come forward, please? Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Presiding Member, for the opportunity to A, respond to the verbal representation, but also have the opportunity to uh, field any questions that the CAP might have, and also to put, uh, I guess, a further 
um, opinion forward beyond that outlined in the officer's report. So I'll firstly start with the verbal representation. Um, I think what we've just experienced is a prime example of why the policies of the zone discourage the proliferation of sensitive uses. Uh, when the desired objective speaks of intensive agriculture and associated activities, all right, um, this in effect highlights that this is not a zone which is supportive of sensitive uses. And I think we've just seen the very reason why when uh, uh, we're told that the, the locality has an amphitheatre type um, character, um, that noises are readily heard when the verbal representation refers to people talking um, as being something that is easily heard. Uh, I think it goes to reinforce the fact that uh, the policies are primarily designed to uh, avoid such sensitive uses and the conflicts which exist as a matter of land use um, in appropriate uh, arrangements and, and siting. Um, there were a number of statements made about four people um, working on the farm and being present. Uh, I discussed that briefly in the gallery with my clients. They are not sure where this evidence comes from um, and so therefore they would suggest that it's unsubstantiated and that should not be considered. Uh, the application, yes, has been amended. It's not a, a new application, as is the right of an applicant. Uh, under the Act, we are permitted to vary the application and the council is happy or has the ability to determine whether it's a mm. fundamental variation at the uh, nature of the application and therefore warrants a new assessment. In this instance, it did not. They, uh, they, the council administration have deemed it to be reasonable amendments and uh, not proceeded to enforce a new application upon it. So I just want to make that point quite clear. Um, the variations, yes, do include changes to the hours of operation in the instruction from my clients. Uh, they are happy to uh, revise the hours of operation as proposed, given uh, the concerns expressed by council staff in the report. Uh, sorry, I'm just working through my, my sort of rushed notes here. I wasn't anticipating having to respond to a representation tonight um, until about half hour before I left. Uh, look. There's photographs of the land, um, uh, the comments about the farming. Uh, our clients are somewhat uh, alarmed that, uh, that their land was accessed without any notification. Um, the farming, as is clearly articulated in the documents, is approved as a farm use, and albeit there have been farming activities which have occurred in the past, uh, for the reasons outlined, uh, those activities have been difficult to sustain for a number of reasons as outlined in the documents. Um, I'll keep an eye on the clock. I appreciate I've only got five minutes. In respect to, I guess, our, our opportunity to put forward a further opinion, we appreciate the officer has a, has a responsibility to put a report to the CAP. Uh, of course, uh, as would come as no surprise to the panel, we don't agree with the recommendation and some of the justification provided in the report for the reason um, of the refusal. There seems to be quite a rigid, in, in our opinion, uh, and a rigid application of some of the policies. Um, words uh, that are used are, uh, are referred to it, the proposed activity not not being envisaged, so therefore it shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't occur in the locality. Well, when we're talking about um, industrial activities, this is not a standalone industrial site. It is not a large scale development. Uh, we have existing use rights for farming and the applicant's intent is to operate the business at a relatively small scale um, within existing compounds, which is not dedicated to farming um, or horticulture. That being said, 
it doesn't make it inappropriate. What, uh, what I think needs to be understood here is the critical purpose of the policies is one that, yes, industrial activities are envisaged, preferably envisaged uses such as value-adding activities. However, it doesn't entirely preclude or prohibit. That wording is clearly not included in the policies. And given the scale of the proposed use, um, we feel that there is some capacity here to be uh, given a favourable consideration, given that it is effectively operating out of the existing farm shed. Um, in terms of the context, uh, whether a farm is on 100 hectares or 4.2 or 2.5, it is a small-scale farm, and that is, that is the facts of the matter before the cap tonight. The applicants are going to endeavour to run a very small-scale operation in terms of the farming, in addition to the excavation business running out of a part of the site which is not um, dedicated to farming but is ancillary too. So in that respect, the, um, uh, the use, we believe, is quite reasonably aligned with the policies. Sorry, uh, Mr Williams. I that's six minutes, so can I just ask you to sum up? Yes, I shall Thank do. Thank you. Uh, I know there's the commentary made about the use being more appropriately in a different zone. Uh, that will place some difficult restrictions on my clients. Um, the the uh, loss of, of time to be able to go to and from um, a site separately um, can be challenging in terms of trying to operate the farming activities as well. Plus, in addition, in this particular area, there is not a, a, a lot of industrial type zoned land which is readily available to accommodate this. I, I note that the Bunnings takes up one of the employment zones and pretty well entirely takes up the whole site. Um, in closing, the, my clients are willing to um, discuss um, further changes to the hours of operation. They appreciate that if this is a matter that is of concern to the panel, then they are happy to operate from 9 to 5, 7 to 5.30. Um, the question was raised, well, how is that enforced? Well, unlike other, other different types of industries, as the CAP has appreciated tonight, this is not something which is a call out on a whim. This is something where appointments need to be made and organised. You, you cannot just get this equipment up and running and off in, in the space of 10 minutes. So that can be managed appropriately by my client. Uh, and furthermore, if it is the number of vehicles which give the panel some concern, we've only got five vehicles. Um, the applicants, my clients, are happy to also make further amendments to the application if there are certain vehicles which the CAP um, do not believe require, are required to be kept on the land. So uh, I'm happy to take any further questions. My clients are here in the gallery as well. If there's a question that I can't answer, um, I would uh, happily seek their advice accordingly. No, thank you. Uh, Aaron. Yeah, thank you, through the Chair. Um, you mentioned at the start of your um, presentation that the dwelling um, nearby, I guess you've, you've stated that this is you know, one of the reasons we um, dwellings aren't um, supported or encouraged in this particular zone. I guess we um, recognise that this is an, an existing dwelling and, it, and, and it's an approved um, lawful use. So I, I guess the, um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts about how you consider this proposal response to their the amenity of that dwelling, and I guess also the the application that's been put to us is has been described as a heavy vehicle and equipment depot, which suggests that there shouldn't be any plant. I guess apart from any any activity associated with the farm, that the plant and equipment shouldn't be operating or being um, you know serviced to any great extent. Um, and I'd be interested in just hearing your thoughts um, and comments about that. Thanks. Thank you, through the presiding chair. Uh, the applicants ha have amended their proposal from the initial concept, um, given the concerns expressed about the hours of operation and those amenity concerns, as has been articulated tonight once more by the representative. Um, they, 
In this locality, you have vehicles, heavy vehicles, using the local road networks and the existing uh, amenity and the acoustics, which are prevalent, are not dissimilar to those which the operation of this business will be comparable with. So Carclue Road itself was upgraded by the council only a few years ago to facilitate heavy vehicle movement to support local industries. Um, that said, the vehicles that my client has advised that the vehicles primarily will come, will leave the site once and come back once. So there may be occasion where there might be local industries which call on their service where there might be, say, a couple of movements a day, but for the most part, um, those movements will be infrequent on a daily basis of, of two movements a day, to and from the site. Um, in terms of the question of maintenance and servicing, the applicant might undertake minor repair work, but in terms of major work, uh, engine um, servicing, uh, equipment servicing, that is something which I understand is not occurring on the subject land, nor will that occur. So I'm getting a nod from the gallery, so yes. Um, so in that respect, given that we're in an area that envisages intensive agricultural activities where um, distribution vehicles, um, distribution depots can occur intensively through long periods of the day and into the night, given the limitations that this proposal is presenting in terms of the hours of operation and the limited and few movements of vehicles, we, uh, we contend that this is something which is appropriate in terms of the anticipated amenity for the locality. Yes, thank you. Just a further question. Um, a s substantial, I guess, part of your argument with this proposal is that um, it is supporting um, activities not just on this site but in the broader um, sort of region and you, you, you've obviously provided a couple of um, supporting letters from other businesses that you support um, you know in terms of the the work um, with it, with the plant um, how do you see that <clears throat> the planning system deals with this type of scenario where you, you've got a, a land use that um, might be partly supporting um, activities you know more broadly um, in fulfilling an objective in the or desired outcome in the in the zone or more broadly but fundamentally the whether the planning system can control that in relation to an activity um, that's put forward if it's a if it's a plant depot whether they're servicing primary production or mining um, how does a how does the planning if a planning consent existed how, do, how does it deal with that and um, I'm interested to hear because that's part of, I guess, the, the argument you've put to us that this is an activity that is supporting other land uses in the, you know, in the region. The application is first and foremost the keeping of vehicles on the subject land in an existing component uh, com area of mm -hmm. of the uh, the site which has been approved for farming as a compound and ancillary vehicles and the like. In terms of the keeping of these vehicles, they are excavation vehicles. They have been used within the local area as is evidenced by the documents before the council. And there will be work which is outside of the immediate locality and not necessarily involving um, valuating to horticultural activities. Um, I guess in, in the sense of, if, if I understand your question correct, and I'm, I'm happy for you to further clarify if I haven't ad addressed the question, is that in terms of the activities which are occurring, this is involving the keeping of the vehicles on the land and some minor ancillary office type work in terms of taking calls and, and bookings and the like. So beyond that, 
um, there's no envisaged uh, activities that that which will occur on the land that go beyond that um, those activities. I, th I think just to expand, I, I guess where I'm going with this is that <coughs> um, a plant depot could be there to service a completely different industry and I, I guess the character of the or, or the nature of the use might be exactly the same. So I guess it's something for the panel we'll, we'll consider further through the, the consideration. Thanks. Paul. Uh, just carrying on the uh, question from Aaron about the um, servicing of vehicles, um, does your client undertake cleaning of the vehicles on the site? Because I imagine after a job they might come back quite quite um, dirty. Are they cleaned on site? Through the chair I might take instruction from the gallery if that's okay. Jamie, do you undertake cleaning of the vehicles on the site? Yep. And, to, to, and what does that involve just for the clarification and understanding of the panel? And also, um, again, linked to what Aaron was asking about the um, that a proportion of the, your client's business does work for primary producers in the area. Um, I imagine the business, though, is fairly broad-based, so it would accept work from um, residential, commercial, industrial. Through the chair, yes, yes, that does occur as well. Any further questions, panel members? No? Um, I, I just have one, um, please, which is um, there's some, what, what, some documentation, some evidence and so forth, I think, which has been submitted by the representors, um, which looks as if um, there's some other activities occurring on site. So um, maybe the storage of excavated material, um, necessarily use the term dumping but um, you know depositing of, yep. of, of materials temporary storage and so forth on site I was just hoping for a bit more of an explanation around the extent of that and how that operates because I I, I guess I had a concern that that might almost be a, a separate use in its own right so I was just hoping you could expand upon that yes thank you mr. presiding member and I appreciate that question so we had can clarify the fill that you refer to was occurred as a part of an activity associated with the preparation of part of the subject land for an application currently before the um, State Planning Commission for the dwelling. So that that fill is, um, was one instance and it is not a symptom of the proposed development and nor does it form part of our application to continue to use the land for the storage of fill um, or the excavation uh, of the land which might be used for fill elsewhere. Uh, that was, uh, those activities were, <coughs> were holus bolus around introducing fill to the land so it could facilitate the construction of a dwelling which is the subject of a separate application. So that is not something which will be ongoing and continuing should the consent be granted. That is not a feature of this application, nor is there an intent to continue to do so from the applicants or the landowners. No, thank you. That's good clarification. Um, I don't believe there are any further questions, so uh, thank you. Welcome to retire to the gallery and observe the rest of the proceedings. Uh, members, do you have any questions you would like to address to council staff at this point? If not, uh, you do, uh, or you have obviously heard from uh, Representor and the applicant, I uh, have a detailed report before you uh, which is recommending refusal of the application. What are your views on this matter? How would you like to proceed? Who would like to go first? Paul, I'm looking at you. Thank you, presiding member. Um, 
my comments for this application are similar to those on the previous one that um, the area does, in, does contain a, a range of land uses uh, but they are primary, primarily primary production related um, be it growing, packing or processing of, of produce but there are also dwellings in the area and I think while I accept the point that sensitive uses such as dwellings aren't anticipated in that zone, the fact is that there are sensitive uses in the locality, in fact immediately diagonally um, opposite this site um, and, and the, those, the residents of those dwellings need to be, their amenity need to be maintained and I don't believe that this proposal will maintain that amenity. Um, Again, this is a use that I don't believe is um, envisaged in the zone. It is a business that, albeit might do, undertake some work on nearby farms, for example. It is a broad-based business serving um, customers from residential, commercial, industrial. Um, I think, unfortunately, I think the planning and design code doesn't adequately cater for these types of activities. Um, I, I pull them under the general umbrella of contractors depot, be it an electrician, a builder, a um, plumber, earth mover. In fact, there's not even a definition that covers it and we from time to time call them stores or the like. But reality is it's, a, it's not a um, primary production use, it is a um, use that involves vehicles that aren't necessarily associated with primary production, um, earth movers, trucks, cars, it's, um, there's a number of employees that will be coming to and from the site and it is a, it's not a use that I don't, I don't believe is envisaged in the area um, and I support the recommendation. Thank you. I'm, I'm Misty. Thank you. Um, I'm sort of battling with this one. The reasons being, like I obviously acknowledge that um, we talk about the transport distribution and it's kind of applicable to the zone. Um, also noting again, obviously, that some of the business that is undertaken is undertaken um, on horticultural land in the council area. Um, sorry, I had another one that was on there in relation to that. Um, the other, I guess on the flip side, the, the concerns that I do have are like obviously the visual impact on the locality. Um, you can clearly obviously see from the roadway um, the vehicles and, and the dumped, or oh, sorry, the, the materials that were left there. Um, I have concerns for the noise impact and the lights obviously on the residents and like you said, it wasn't envisaged, um, you know, to be a lot of houses there, but there are houses. Um, there is concern that I noted in one of the documents around the non-automatic gate, so the blocking of the roadway to essentially unlock that gate and get in and out. Um, so I'm not sure if that's been rectified. Sorry, I should have asked that earlier. Um, I think in terms of protection of the rural environment and, and I guess the land use as it is now, I just have concerns, again, obviously for the visual appeal and, and how that's going to you know, continue or how we sort of uplift the, the look of this place versus, I guess, what what it's looking like now and how the trucks are going to impact on that. Um, so, yeah, I'm still sort of deciding at the moment. Um, so hopefully, yeah, I can come to a conclusion very shortly. Oh, thank you. Uh, Aaron? Yeah, thanks through the chair. Um, look, yeah, I've... Um, struggled with this one in terms of the the appropriateness of the use. Um, I've heard the the um, submission from the um, applicant. Um, the the use um, I I don't believe has a strong um, link with primary production. I, I do understand that the the business does do a lot of um, or stated to do quite a bit of work in that field. But essentially, though, I guess we're still assessing what is a, a, a plant depot. And I'm not sure that, uh, as I mentioned before, that, that it, if, if an approval is granted, that you can have any control over where, where the, the business will spend its energy or its time. And I guess we need to have a look at the land use from the perspective of, 
of how um, what its function and what its character is, and and how it supports or doesn't support the the um, desired outcomes of the zone, and how it responds to other uses in the the locality. Um, I th the desired outcome one clearly talks to intensive ag agriculture and associated value adding enterprises. So. I guess you um, then question about what extent value adding this is doing. I think the extensive list of the plant and equipment that's parked at the site. I think there's there's few parts of the of the plant that will actually be directly associated with any farming on this particular site. And I think it's clear to me that this is more a standalone plant um, depot, and that. Um, and I, these types of uses are typically within employment, strategic employment zones. Um, the the other reference within the um, the performance outcome 1.1 is again there's the reference is, is very strongly tied to associated value adding processing, warehousing, distribution, um, but that's associated with the agriculture and intensive horticulture. Um, the proliferation of other land uses that may be sensitive to those activities is avoided. So I guess the, there's a question about to what extent this, this land use is, is perhaps um, uh, likely to impede or impact horticulture activities. There is a potential with dust and um, mentioned about wash down and things like that that could impact horticulture. Um, and there's also mentioned the other matter that that um, we do need to consider is the impact on that sensitive receiver, which is the dwelling um, some 150 metres away. I guess we have limited information about what the the extent of impacts are in terms of a noise. We don't have an acoustic assessment. Um, there, we've seen there's impacts of lighting that um, that that have, have impacted the neighbour you know, from night activity. So I guess there is, there is indication that the the land use may have um, some impacts on that sensitive receiver. So I guess on balance, I'm um, of the view that this proposal isn't um, appropriate for the for this particular site, having regard to the zone and what it seeks to achieve. Thank you. Um, my view, members, um, for me, I think this essentially comes down to a um, question of land use and following that question, um, the level of impact. And I say that because I think as um, all of you have articulated, um, this is a, and I'll use that classic uh, planning term, this is a finely balanced um, uh, application. Um, I think we are looking at a land use that uh, I think it's fair to say is not envisaged in the um, locality but um, to a certain extent it's not specifically discouraged either although as Aaron's quite rightly pointed out there is um, some policy that does talk about the avoidance of, of uses that don't particularly align with what's envisaged. Um, I think when you have a situation where there is a land use that is not necessarily envisaged um, then it, it brings you to look at what is the level of impact from that um, from that use on the locality, um, and as we've heard, um, it's not necessarily a value adding activity. Um, it's not necessarily beneficial to uh, the users that are anticipated in the zone, um, and I think when you look at the scale, the intensity, and um, the potential impacts. There are several um, which I find a little hard to reconcile. From from my point of view, they they step marginally over what could reasonably be expected in a primary production area. As we've heard about noise, light, dust. To a certain extent, all of those things need to be anticipated from primary production activities. There will be, um, I'm not a farmer, ploughing, tilling, um, you know, odour, noise, there'll be uh, equipment working at night. Those things all have to be expected in a, in a primary production area. And um, there is case law, well-established case law, that the level of amenity that is enjoyed in a residential area cannot reasonably be anticipated in a primary production area. So 
to a certain extent the impacts from this development are to be anticipated but it's the level of scale and intensity for me that just push it marginally over what what could be um, I guess reasonably anticipated in a locality such as this so for those reasons um, I think it is finely balanced but I, I fall on the side of um, agreeing with the views that that Paul and Aaron have expressed um, so that's that's my view um, we do obviously have a recommendation before us um, for refusal of the application how do members wish to proceed is there someone prepared to move that recommendation or an alternative Paul you're moving yep. as put so Paul is moving the recommendation. Is there a seconder? Seconded, Aaron. Oh, that is the motion. All those in favour, please raise your hand. So that's carried unanimously. So for the benefit of those who are with us, the application um, has been refused. Now there is a right of appeal that is uh, available to the applicant should they wish to take that up uh, through the Environment Resource and Development Court. Um, and uh, I'm sure the staff would be happy to provide you with any uh, advice around that uh, the next business day. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you for um, uh, your patience in waiting for the panel to deal with that item. Um, we must now move to our next item. You're welcome to remain or, um, of course, leave us at this point. So thank you. Um, members, the next item on our agenda uh, is uh, application Number 22017809, this is an application by Lifestyle Solutions at 33 to 35 Folding Avenue in Manapara. It is in the Suburban Activity Centre Zone. It was performance assessed given public notification. How could I neglect to invite back our member? Thank you. I'm just going through my introduction so you haven't missed anything. Um, and uh, the recommendation is to grant planning approval. Connie, is there anything you would like to... Uh, touch on uh, as an introduction to this item. Adam. Yeah, thank you. Um, we did receive some late correspondence from the applicant, so that's Michael Grogan from URPS. He was unable to attend the meeting. Um, given the late notice, we weren't able to arrange for a, a video link. However, he is available to answer any questions by phone, so we can dial that through if there's questions from the panel. Uh, thank you. Members, do you have any questions of council staff? If not, oh, Aaron. Yeah, um, it is interesting. The uh, obviously there's a new definition in the in the code um, for supported accommodation. But um, I guess how, how does the city of Playford interpret change in land use um, in terms of a, a detached dwelling? Um, I guess I'm just interested in your thoughts because I appreciate it's a little bit open in terms of. Um, how a change of land use from a dwelling is interpreted. Thank you. Uh, yeah, not 100% clear, but I'll, yeah, I'll answer and I suppose if you need additional information. Um, I suppose, yeah, definitely one of the offsets of the, the new code is that land use being introduced. I suppose as a council we've received a fairly high uptake of these forms of development. Um, and one of the benefits of this land use being is that applicants are able to be transparent in what they're looking to use the site for. Um, we've probably seen historically a lot of dwelling applications where there might have been further uses down the track. Um, and it also allows for alignment with the building rules considerations, which is different from a dwelling to that of supported accommodation. Is that sort of what you're after? Yeah. No, thank you. Uh, other questions of the staff members? No. In that case, uh, you do have a comprehensive report before you with a recommendation to grant uh, planning approval. How would you wish to proceed? Nathan. Thank you. Through the Chair. Um, 
yeah, I'm quite comfortable with this proposal. It's um, to land use, which is expected in the suburban activity centre zone. Um, it's relatively low in scale. Obviously, support accommodations can be at much larger scales and large fa larger facilities. This is small scale and adaptive to that um, residential locality. Um, it is a form of housing that's important um, in our neighbourhoods, and for those to be at this scale to adapt to those areas is. Um, yeah, it's it's a positive. So um, obviously, car parking and everything's already provided, and being the fact that it's an existing dwelling, it can easily revert back to a um, a dwelling at any point in time in the future. So no concerns with this from my perspective. Thank you, Misty. Um, I pretty much like agree in terms of like it is expected land use you know in the suburban activity there's not really any change to the residents per se other than to obviously um look at turning into or caring for children um i did have one concern i guess sort of related to the use and that was around sort of the increase in i guess um like anger care and community housing in the neighbourhoods, etc. And I know there has been an increase in, in youth crime. And I guess that, that I still hold that concern because I, I'm very aware of it happening um, in some of the newer areas. And obviously, if we're starting to convert some of these houses over to that sort of um, use, then yeah, I just, I guess I'll, I'll keep that concern. But otherwise, in terms of planning, I don't really have any concerns there. Thank you. Uh, Paul. Yes, I um, support the recommendation that say um, use that's envisaged in the zone. Um, the presence of a site manager 24-7 will ensure that um, the um, residents are, um, are managed and uh, under control, so to speak. Um, I, don't, I note that the representatives have some concerns about um, antisocial behaviour and the like in the area, but I think they're that's their existing problems, and I don't believe that they'll, they'll be um, exacerbated by this proposal, in particular having regard that there will be a, a manager on site to, um, to address any issues should they arise. Thank you. Aaron. Yeah, thanks, through the Chair. Um, yeah, agree with all the other comments. Um, uh, the, I, I guess this is a, a, um, an increasing trend that we are seeing, and especially with um, you know, houses that are, are, are dedicated to, um, you know, it might be a young family, uh, or it might be children um, or adults with disability, and the, the uh, this notion that there's ageing within um, and living within the community, rather than standalone facilities. So, I guess the um, the the um, some of the impacts or the the concerns of the of um of this type of, of use i guess the planning system i think will, will have difficulty dealing with you know behavioral type issues of of um of it might be children or so i th i think um it's difficult to address the, the some of the concerns that the representative has raised i guess it might be opportunity for staff to to ask the applicant to nominate a you know that that the manager is able to take or take calls and an offer that you know should concerns arise that then the manager can or, or other contact person can um, you know, address any concerns that arise. Um, I guess from my experience, it tends to be more effective if if the um, you know neighbour can go straight to the the contact person, and that sort of then takes counsel out of you know, any ongoing issues that might arise. So that might be something for for staff to consider. But look broadly, I I think the um, you know, it maintains the character of the dwelling. There's adequate car parking, so I'm um, supportive of the proposal. No, thank you. Uh, similar views, members uh, solicited as envisaged land use provides sheltered ground level entry, relatively level site, landscaped and open outdoor areas, sufficient car parking available, and and the application does talk about some neighbourly, um, if, if I can use that word, arrangements to be put in place um, to to facilitate discussions and uh, between the parties. So. Um, I'm also comfortable with the recommendation. It sounds like we are all in agreement. Is someone prepared to move the recommendation? Move, Nathan. Is there a seconder? 
Second of Paul, all those in favour, please raise your hand. That's carried unanimously. Thank you. That application has been granted planning approval. Members, that does, if memory serves, take us to uh, item seven, which is applications for consideration for category one, of which there are nil. Uh, outstanding matters, ap appeals and deferred items. Uh, Adam, I assume there's no, or is there any appeal you wish to update us on? No. And that takes us to other business, and we do have an item here uh, which is in reference to the operating procedures for the council assessment panel, and I believe we're joined by a familiar face in Matt, our uh, previous assessment manager. So, um, Matt, is there anything you'd like to touch on as a, an introduction to the item, please? Thank you. Um, as outlined in the report, uh, what we sought to do is update the operating procedures principally in line with the model meeting procedures provided by the Local Government Association. We've allowed for appropriate carryovers where considered relevant. Um, as outlined within the report, we sought to clarify just a couple of points we've previously um, been uh, had to consider as a, as a panel prior, um, uh, as an example being the consideration of um, representatives being able to be heard post a deferral. Um, there's some, some items uh, that allow for further discussion of the panel that I really entice. Um, one being uh, the inclusion there of uh, reasons for refusal. Um, you'll note under the PD Act and as, as highlighted previously by Paul, um, the there is no consideration required by the panel to put reasons behind their refusals of applications under the PD Act. Um, and uh, a development, uh, sorry, a uh, review of an assessment manager's uh, decision. Those within this document uh, are allowed for to enable condition, sorry, reasons for those decisions to be made. Um, should the panel be minded to exclude that and align principally with the PDI Act, um, we would recommend a couple of changes to, to these operating procedures. Um, one being uh, the amendment of clause 11.3.7.2 to just reflect the Development Act, and the other being uh, the removal of clause 11.3.8.2 to remove reference to a review of an assessment manager's decision. It's a couple of um, minor variations that we've identified in, in item 12.1, uh, very minor in nature, just to, uh, to allow for the wording of Development Act in full um, and uh, deletion of reference to an assessment manager policy which we're yet to enact. Um, I'll note um, in the, uh, I'll note that uh, whilst the, the panel is considering its, its meeting procedures and, and how they wish to go about that. I'd like to just draw the panel's attention to a motion that was put without notice to council in, uh, in its ordinary council in July of this year. Uh, it sought to commence each meeting of council with an acknowledgement of, count, of, of country. Sorry. So um, again, whilst in consideration of its operating procedures, it's something that the panel may, may seek to lend their mind to. Um, I'd highlight, uh, the recording of meetings has been has been raised previously. Uh, we'll be seeking to put a separate report to the panel on, on that matter next month. Thank you. Uh, members, do you have any perhaps questions initially with respect to the draft procedures? Paul. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, Matt mentioned that I'd raised some issues. They, they were, um, I'd, I'd emailed Adam and um, Matt this morning about all well, say about those um, so that other members weren't aware of those questions but they were just pointing out some couple of type typographical issues but then que querying about the um, decision making under I think no item nine I apologize there I hadn't read the preamble properly it talks about part seven of the PDI Act and part four of the Development Act but as um, then the other one was about the reasons for decision. Uh, sorry, con conditions, and I, I would I would appreciate some clarity there that um, for applications under the Development Act that we must include conditions, but that the panel would have discretion to put reasons for applications under the PDI Act. So, um, 
if staff could perhaps work on that wording. Because if, if we do include require conditions for uh, reasons for all conditions we accept are currently in compliance, we haven't we don't ever ever do that. Which which clause is it? Sorry, Paul, in particular. Um, it's uh, Matt, Matt mentioned. I think it's ten point. No, sorry, eleven point three point seven point two. So, in relation to each development application, 7.2, the reasons for granting or refusing and for the imposition of any conditions. So, if that could be just clarified in relation to application under the Development Act. Yes, yes, I agree. Um, because it's rare to see any reasons given for conditions for um, applications under the PDI Act now, and it's no longer a requirement as I understand it. So, yes, agree with that. Um, and I'm sure that wording change can be made. Do other members have questions, Aaron? Oh, I'd just like to say I support the, if, if there was a proposal for an acknowledgement to country, I, I think, uh, yeah, it's a good idea and I support it. Yeah, thank you, I do too. I, as members know, I, I chair three panels and, and sit on another, and um, one of the other panels that I chair has an acknowledgement to country um, at the start, and um, I think it's a, um, yeah, a very positive thing to do. So I'd, I'd be more than happy, um, as presiding member, to uh, to have that at the start of every meeting. That'd be good. Any other questions or comments, members? Paul, just one. Um, the presiding member mentioned about other panels. Um, recently, another panel that I set set on the. Um, they went through a similar updating of procedures and one item they included was to record in the minutes in the event that a um, application is determined on the casting vote of the presiding member that the minutes make reference to that. Um, that was a case where, um, and that was that would be for approval or refusal. So whether, the, how staff would feel about adding a, um, a note to that effect. Through the, through the chair, um, not, not concerned e either way. Um, I think the, the outcome of the, the decision remains the outcome of the decision, um, and whether it's uh, whether it comes down to that vote, um, it doesn't trigger the the appeal right or otherwise. Um, so without works, um, should the panel be minded to, to include that, there's no harm in doing so either. Yeah, so I guess it's um, for the deliberation of the panel. Um, I don't have any significant objection. I know that um, we operate a little separately to council and that you can't um, record the way each member voted. Um, uh, so, you know, that's an opportunity um, at council if they call for a division. That doesn't uh, exist, obviously, with panels. Um, but I would assume there's no particular reason why we couldn't uh, potentially include something like that. Um, Aaron, do you have a view? Yeah, well, I just, um, sorry, I was talking a bit loud there, but um, just wanted to clarify, I guess, from, from Paul, what the thinking was behind that. I guess, um, from my point of view, I think it's the collective decision um, rather than so much of the mechanics of how we make the decision, and so I'd, I'd be more inclined to um, support not going down that path, but I'd be interested to hear what the thinking was. Uh, I believe it was because the minutes of that cap, of that cap um, either they say adopt by consensus or majority, and then I think the follow-on from that as well could be by the casting vote of the presiding member. So it covers all bases. But I do take the point that the minutes just record whether it's been approved or refused. It doesn't include the mover or the seconder. Um, doesn't even indicate if there were any amendments to the conditions. It just it's a, a factual thing. So um, certainly not. Um, I be, wouldn't be concerned if it's not in there. All right. Uh, well, I'll leave that perhaps till we get to the point where we want to uh, move the recommendation or otherwise. I, I just had one comment um, for members to consider as well, which was in respect of clause 9.6.3. So 
first of all, apologies to the staff that I didn't raise this in advance. Um, but I, that clause refers to the fact that where there are no representatives to be heard, that the presiding member may, at their discretion, allow an applicant to be heard. My, um, you know, I'm happy to take the staff's advice on this, would be that um, perhaps that should read the presiding member may, um, with the support of the panel, you would have seen tonight that I typically ask the panel whether or not you're happy to hear um, from uh, an applicant or in some cases a, a representative who might have changed their mind. Um, I think it's important as a panel that we're, we have a degree of, a certain degree of flexibility around that. Um, and I think if it's with the support of the panel, that means that it's not purely my decision um, and that I would look for your support, which I think is an important thing. Happy to take the staff's advice on that. So, Adam. Yeah, thank you. Um, look, yeah, not, not in opposition to it. I suppose it's more a question of practicalities and we do, in time to time, get questions ahead of a meeting as to whether someone would have the ability to present to the panel uh, at present, I suppose. That would be then in an email to yourself, Jeff. Um, just the practicality of yeah, circulating that ahead of a meeting, getting consensus and advising an applicant, um, yeah, could could have some challenges. No, I'm happy to take that point. So, members, we've heard of some possible amendments which we may or may not wish to work through. There is uh, a recommendation, um, when I can find it, uh, around adopting the uh, meeting procedures. Um, that would obviously be subject, I think, to the fact that we are all in agreement around a clause that Paul alluded to earlier, around 11.3.7.2. Um, around clarifying that the reasons for conditions only apply to Development Act DAs. With that potential change made, how do members feel? Would you like any further changes or is someone prepared to move the recommendation as is? Oh, and also, my apologies, um, as is on the screen, uh, including an acknowledgement of country, which I think is a, an important step, which it sounds like we're all in agreement with. No, well, I think we'll just leave the bottom two points momentarily to see what the bulk of members um, think. <coughs> because it sounds like there's some debate around those bottom two and whether we include them or otherwise. Just, I guess, to clarify for members, I'm not, um, I, I'm not overly phased by the bottom dot point, um, whether you would like it to be at my, my discretion or with the support of the panel. Um, I believe most other meeting procedures for panels that I sit on have it at my discretion uh, and it's limited to that so I'm, I'm happy in that regard. I may still ask you regardless to help me inform my decision but yeah, I think that's, yeah. Yeah. so I think we can delete the bottom dot point is the nods I'm getting uh, Adam. Yeah, the, the second point was around recording the casting vote or otherwise. Um, how do members know? So I think we're I think we're removing that point as well, um, please. So the uh, recommendation now appears before you on the screen, members, subject to those two, three amendments. Does anyone need clarity on that? No. In that case, is someone prepared to move the recommendation? Move, Nathan. Is there a seconder? Seconded, Aaron. All those in favour, please raise your hand. And that's carried unanimously. Thank you. So thank you to the staff um, for preparing uh, that item. It's critically important we have up-to-date meeting procedures and uh, it sounds like we can look forward to a review of an assessment manager um, policy uh, coming shortly as well, so uh, that's excellent.
Members, that takes us to confidential matters, of which I understand there are nil. Um, is there any item of planning policy that any member would like to discuss this evening? No. In that case, uh, I am happy to declare the meeting closed at 7.48pm. Thank you to members uh, for your attendance and thank you also to uh, staff for attending and for your help and guidance this evening. Thank you. Support your local theatre and arts industry and enjoy a show at the Shedley. Playford's iconic Shedley Theatre is bringing a great selection of local and national performances